Many of you I would have been seen for the first time. This afternoon it is our pleasure to have with us here at a question and answer session to deal with the summer travel program. Representatives from the United States Embassy who are here to share with us all the information that you will require in terms of engaging the program. It's our pleasure to partner with the Embassy of the United States to do this because I think that we have an interest in ensuring that you use your summer wisely in terms of earning funds to pay your fees so that we can have um, minimal disruption during the course of the semester. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you today the representatives from the United States Embassy, um, Mr. Jeff Oswheeler. Jeff, can you stand and be recognized, please? Give him a hand as he stands. <laughs> Jerika Lamar. And Deline Johnson. And of course, you don't need me to introduce your principal and pro vice chancellor, Professor Dale Weber, who will say a few words. And in the audience, she says she wants to be with her people. So we say it's okay. Your guild president, Amalora mm -hmm. Wilson. Let's hear it for her. So our session today, ladies and gentlemen, will be very simple. We are going to start off with um, the principal giving some comments, then your guild president, and then we'll turn over to the officials from the United States Embassy. They will take you through um, a presentation, and then we have allocated ample time for questions and answers, and I know you have questions in relation to this program. So we thank you for coming. I know we are starting slow, but I predict that by the time we would have finished, this hall would have been filled. So without any further comments, may I now invite uh, Principal Weber to come forward and make some remarks. Please let us give him a round of applause. Thank you very much, Registrar. Team from the US Embassy, welcome to the Mona campus. Students here in the assembly hall, students online, good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon to you all. Excellent. It is with great pleasure that I say a few words at an important juncture for you as you take this careful decision. The University of the West Indies is clear that access, alignment, and agility is what it takes for us to be a successful institution. Access means you need to get to your courses, and you also need to access that education, which is more than what you learn in the classroom. But in order to get here, you need to be able to clear fees, and I know that for many of you, the opportunity of work and study gives us that chance to plan for the following year, and the following year, and the following year. How do you do it? How do you take the best advantage of it? How do you ensure you do not run afoul of our laws or the laws of the USA? The US Embassy team here will share a lot of that information and the registrar and his team will share information so that we are best able to do as we would like to do for you and you for yourselves. Now, why is this important? Not just for the finances, although that's important. I want you to think of the work study as an opportunity to open doors. You do not know the cultural exchange positives that have come from the work study program. Jamaica is one of the largest participants in the US work study program, and it is primarily students. And amongst the students, the UWI has the largest share of students. So you almost own this program, and you need to take advantage of it. But it means you are now an ambassador, ambassador for your university, ambassador for your country, as you make the transition for that work study program, which means you have to do things right. You, eyes will always be on you, and you will need to be representing your family, your community, your university, and your country. I want to say thank you to the USA and the US Embassy in particular, because the opportunity could be offered anywhere. 
The overture to come here and actually share information and field your questions gives us an advantage which you need to take advantage of. But it also gives the U.S. Embassy a feel for the wider Jamaica community because that exchange that needs to happen starts right here, right now. We know more about you and you get to know more about where the possibilities are. There are responsibilities that go with this and you need to be sure that those responsibilities are fulfilled. The U.S. Embassy, through its operations, in fact the entire consulate, have been friends and partners to the university. Fulbright scholars come every year. Programs such as the Health Connect Jamaica, which is allowing HIV treatment throughout all of Jamaica, are funded by the U.S. government. There are so many partnerships that allow us to increase our overtures in terms of what we do for our students, our careers and placements, our opportunities for internships. We're glad that we have partners such as the U.S. and the U.S. Embassy, and we thank them for their sharing and caring. We now need to do our part, and I look forward to your questions your contributions as we take advantage. Share the word so that those of us, not just in the room, but in the Zoom, wherever you are across the UWI, the open campus. Let Thank you, Dr. Stanberry. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I hope you all are feeling well. I hope you all are feeling ready to get the information here this evening. I know, because I've seen many of you at my office, that going on work and travel is an opportunity for many of us, an opportunity that affords us a lot of things, you know? Education, tuition, hall, and the other. We'll talk about that later. But this opportunity is one, one in a lifetime. I've never seen something like this before, and I'm grateful that it's been shared with us here at the University of the West Indies. And so I hope that when we lead ourselves into this session, we lead ourselves with an open mind, a mind of will, a mind of determination, a mind of learning, a mind of preparing, so that when we go forward, going into like March, April, we're ready to head on do what we have to do, learn from the culture that we're going, and embrace it. So, I'm happy to be here with you this evening. I'm happy to see you out. I'm happy that some of us are here early and some of us will be a little late. And it's a privilege per se to see that this opportunity is not just for you, but for many out there, because you're one of the first set who will be granted this opportunity, and I hope you take advantage of it. If you have any questions, you can always ask me. If you need a signature, you know where to find me. And I also want to say thank you to the U.S. Embassy, and of course to the University of the West Indies. When this idea was shared with me, I was just drawn aback i was happy per se because i've never seen anything like that we've had cases in which we have work and travel agencies coming here but never once i've seen and i've been here for a while the u.s embassy coming and saying listen this is it this is how you do it and this is how we plan to get it done and so to see you here and to see this opportunity here for you elated that's that's how i'm feeling right now i feel my, my glad back boss all right and so i hope that you just take advantage of this opportunity and hope that when we leave this we share it with our friends share it with those who weren't here who missed this and that we know that at the end of the day we're doing our best to get the best for us thank you so much for your time and i look forward to doing this session with you all thank you thank you amalora so now we get to the meat of the matter and again let me say how happy we are to have um, these representatives from the United States Embassy and the presentation I'm going to hand over now to um, Jeff who will take you through the presentation and I'm sure he has reinforcement with him to be able to answer any question that might arise thank you so very much principal and myself will be taking our leave and we hope that this is a will be a fruitful and productive session <clears throat> and that you'll all be able to introduce uh, the other members of uh, the non-immigrant visa team that are here today and we're each going to take a section of the presentation and um, tell you a little bit more about what the program is just if you if you don't know already how to make a proper application and really important some ways to protect yourself as you go to the United States engage in your work and return to Jamaica at the end of the program we're going to allow plenty of time at the end of the session to answer questions because we really want to hear from you. What are your concerns? What could we do better? How can we help facilitate your process as you get into this application year? Um, before we get started and I introduce my, my colleagues here, how many of you have been on this program before, have gone to the United States on summer work and travel? 
So you're all new to the program. That's great. So it's, it's a good couple at the back there, but uh, uh, most of the folks here in the hall have never been on this program before. We get a lot of returning students, but we really wanted to do outreach to new students, students that have not done this before. So that's fantastic. Um, we're glad to see that. So without uh, any delay, we're going to get right into the presentation, and I'll start by introducing my colleague, Deline Johnson, from the Non-Immigrant Visa Unit, and she'll start talking a little bit about the application, the program, and the application process. Thank you very much. All right, so today we're talking about the J-1 Summer Work Travel Program. And what we intend to discuss are simply what you see there. It says, what is the Summer Work Travel? We call it SWT. What is SWT? Who qualifies? Which jobs can I do when I go on SWT? How long can I work? How do I apply? How can I ensure my safety? So these are some of the things that we are going to discuss in our presentation today, all right? So please listen keenly. All right, so the, what is the Summer Work Travel Program? The Summer Work Travel Program is a program primarily for university students, right? And who will spend their summer vacation in the United States working and experiencing U.S. culture. Most participants typically work, typically work in non-skilled service positions, whether at resorts, hotels, restaurants, amusement parks, okay? So the goal of the program is really to experience America and American culture. It is not just to make a lot of money, right? I'm sure you agree. So the policies that we are talking about today are intended to keep you safe and to make sure that the program is actually achieving its goals. I remember as a former student here at the University of the West Indies, I actually went on the JET program. I went on a program where I could work as well, and it was very useful in exposing me to that culture, which I was actually studying here at the university. I was actually studying languages, Japanese being one of them. And it exposed me to that culture, and I was also able to pay my fees. I was also able to travel and learn more about that culture and learn a bit more about that language. So it's a very good opportunity to experience that culture, but also to share Jamaican culture as well, in addition to getting the funds needed to support or to contribute to your education, all right? So who qualifies for this program? First of all, what is most important is that you are a full-time student at a post-secondary academic, on a post-secondary academic program, sorry, at an educational institution, and you plan to continue your studies, all right? you must be maintaining a full course of study. And there are no age limits. There is no limit on the number of times that you may participate. You must speak English well enough to satisfy the counselor officer that you can fully participate in the proposed program. Final year students may apply to participate during the academic break immediately following their graduation provided that they applied for and are issued a J-1 visa before their final year ends. Other qualifications, it would be good to have good grades and strong ties to your home country, and they must, sorry, SWT participants must demonstrate that they will return in time for the beginning of the new or the following semester, all right? Okay, so we will now talk about the process, and I'll hand over back to Jeff to continue with that segment. Thank you, Delene. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me this time? Perfect, all right. So uh, how many of you have already started an application for the Summer Work and Travel program? 
So a few here in the hall, and you've been working with a recruiter, you kind of know the rough outlines of the process. For those of you that maybe have not initiated an application yet, we wanted to walk through the primary steps in making an application and what the whole, the totality of the process looks like. Um, so first, you as the student are going to work with a recruiter, an agent, somebody who might be conducting recruitment here on campus or at job fairs in order to have a, a placement with what's called a U.S. sponsor. So we have organizations in the United States that are specifically designated and vetted to be able to place students at exchange sites around the United States. These are the job opportunities that you'll fill uh, in the program uh, during the course of the summer. <clears throat> From that, you're gonna receive a form called a DS-2019. This is your official application form. You go to the U.S. Embassy for your visa interview, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. It's not as scary as it sounds. We're not as mean as people tell you. Uh, and you'll make your application and do your interview for the visa itself. Once the visa interview is concluded and you receive the visa, you'll then travel to the United States within the predefined period for the program. Uh, in Jamaica, that's a four-month period throughout the course of the summer. If you conclude your work in the United States, you then have the opportunity to travel for up to 30 days before the return date for Jamaica's program, which this year is September 7th of 2023. Again, a sponsor is officially designated, they're specifically vetted, and uh, they must follow certain regulations in recruiting students to take part in this program. That's meant to protect you. It's meant to assure that you have a good work opportunity that exposes you to the exchange dimensions of the program, like meeting US citizens, engaging in exchange with US culture. Um, but you might also use a recruiter or an agency here in Jamaica that is working directly with a U.S. sponsor in the United States. So here in Jamaica, you'll see a mix of things. Sponsors might come down themselves and engage in recruitment activity, or they might work with a uh, recruiter or agent here in country to do that for them. And as the Department of State, even though we help manage the program and vet um, and regulate the sponsors. We don't endorse any specific sponsors or any particular recruiters. Um, they just simply have to be registered and certified to participate in the program. But we don't recommend one over another or consider one better than another. They just have to meet the, the set criteria. Now that agency coordinator, whether it's directly from the sponsor or through your recruiter, um, they might help you with a range of other things relating to your travel to the United States, housing arrangements, travel arrangements, other things. You can also make an application directly with a designated sponsor. Let's say you've gone on the program in a prior year and you've established a direct relationship with that sponsoring agency or organizer. You can be recruited or hired directly through them and not have to work through a local agency or recruiter. So what jobs can you do? You'll see a number of examples here. They really have to be seasonal in focus because the program was created to give opportunities in sectors of the US market where there's a lot of seasonal demand. And usually that's in the summertime, the hospitality season, vacation season, times when there's a, a, a short-term seasonal need for additional assistance in different types of uh, market sectors in the United States, especially hospitality, tourism, these sorts of things. Uh, one of the reasons Jamaica is so successful in the program and has so many participants, other than being very close to the United States, is that it's an English-speaking country, English proficiency isn't a problem here, and that's a big part of qualifying to be part of the program and being successful in the exchange opportunity that you're given. And these jobs can be anywhere in the United States. Uh, there's, a, if, there's a site on the Department of State site called Bridge USA, which has a map that shows you all the different places where summer work and travel students are placed in the United States. Every state in the United States has summer work and travel students participating every summer. You can experience every corner of the United States. Even my tiny little state of Iowa, not very many people, there are summer work and travel students from all over the world at various places in that state every summer. And generally, these are um, jobs in the hotel sector, restaurants, amusement parks, 
um, sometimes aquatics facilities, pools, water parks, this sort of thing. There are a number of jobs you really can't do or not meant to do uh, as part of this program, and I, I want to make sure you, you understand what those are. Remember, this is seasonal work. Um, it's not meant to be um, ongoing labor in the United States. So things like childcare, for example, are not allowed under the summer work and travel program. You can't be a driver, an Uber driver, a taxi driver, some kind of uh, uh, a livery type driver in the United States under this program as well. Beautician, esthetician, hair care, nail care, that sort of thing, again, also not allowed. And then gambling and things like, you know, basic janitorial services are not really part of the program. So if you have a recruiter or someone else who's um, indicating that will be the type of work you're going to do, you should ask more questions and you should verify that it's employment that is really uh, certified under the program. And then finally, how long can you stay in the United States? Um, there are going to be program. remember I mentioned this form, the DS-2019, that's your official form that you take to the embassy when you do your visa interview. They will, that will have program start and end dates. That indicates when you can start work, when you have to finish your job. Um, it's very clearly specified on that form. But remember, whatever you do, however long those start and end dates are, they have to be within the four-month period defined for Jamaica in the program. Remember, ending se September 7th. And if you leave your job early for some reason, let's say it's not working out or you get sick or something along those lines, you do have to depart uh, the United States once you've left that opportunity. You do have a chance after you complete your work on the end date to remain up to an additional 30 days in the United States so long as you return by September 7th, 2023, the end date for the program. So we got a little more presentation work to do, so I'm going to pass it back to Delene, and she'll talk a bit more about the end of the process. OK, so we learned how long we could stay in the US on the SWT program. And now we're going to look at how do we apply, or how do you apply for the visa? All right, so we learned that we contact we can get a sponsor or an agency who then will give us the DS 2019. And that basically has the program name, program number, your name, um, the start date, the end date. So it has all of that information. And it's a vital piece of or very essential document that you will need to bring to your visa appointment. So you receive that form and you would pay your service fee online for the program. Then now, once re you receive your DS 2019 and you have paid the service fee, you would use that information to apply for the J-1 visa online at the embassy's website. So you would complete the visa application online using the information from the DS 2019, all right? And on the same website, you can pay your visa fee and schedule your visa interview or your visa appointment. Now, when you come to the interview, you have to bring the documents with you. And we're going to go into which documents you need to take with you. It's also on the, the list that many of you were given at the door, the handout. All right, so we're going to go through that shortly. So when you come for the interview, you will receive your visa. And it's only after receiving your visa you should book your travel. All right. Do not book it prior to receiving the visa, because if there are any delays or if you're refused, then you would have lost your money. I see the young man shaking his head at the front, so he knows what that is about. And then you can enjoy your time there. All right. So, as I said, the service fee must be paid and that you can pay that and then complete the application online, schedule and appear for the interview and then you would bring the documents with you. And we're gonna look at the documents shortly. What do you bring to the visa interview? And this is very important, all right? So you would bring your DS-160. What is that? That is the form that you get at the end of completing the online application. That's the last page that you're gonna see, and you print that. 
right? It asks for a photo, you upload your photo, and you print it. So that's the confirmation sheet, what we call DS-160. And you will need a photo, passport size photo. It must not be more than six months old, and it should be done on a plain white background. Persons come with a blue background, yellow background, they take it behind a curtain, or they take it with behind a wall, and it, it, no, it should be on a plain white background, okay? You need to take your valid passport with you, as well as the original DS-2019. So the original that you got through the mail, that's the one you're gonna take. So we would not, we would not take a photocopy. You have to have the original, okay? So please pay attention there. Now, let's look at the, the back of the, the handout that you have, right? It says valid passport, J1 document checklist. It says, please bring the following documents with you on the day of your interview, your valid passport, DS-160, otherwise known as a confirmation page. I would say two passport size photos, reason being you might lose one. And when it comes to the photo, please, you do not need it to be stamped by a justice of the peace. So persons come with the stamp in it and the ink all over it. You don't need to have it stamped by a justice of the peace, all right? Two passport size photos, the original DS-2019, and you will also need to bring your service receipt, and that's what you get after paying the service fee. So you'll bring the service receipt as well as the DS-2019, the original. You'll get other documents from your prospective employer, such as the insurance coverage letter. You need to bring that as well. And you'll also need to bring proof of full-time student status from your academic institution. What do we mean by that? It means your current registration or status letter, which states that you are currently a full-time student, all right? And for those who have already graduated, current proof of your graduation date, all right? Please um, make note of whatever questions you may have when you're through. We'll be able to field those questions if you have questions about that, all right? So what happens during the interview? Oh, sorry, we have a, a sample of the DS 2019 right here, as I was saying to you, all right? So the sample has all the information that we will need, and at the bottom, you would put your name, the date, and you would, um, sorry, the, your name and the place as well as the date, all right? So it has to be dated and signed by you when you come in for your interview, all right? What happens at the interview? You will need to respond to questions in English. You don't need to be fluent in English, but you should be able to respond to simple questions. And the counselor officer will ask you about your job responsibilities, as well as your course of study and other questions that are pertaining to your job, prospective job, and your, your school, all right? And as, as, as Jeff had said before, you cannot work in the U.S. once your school program officially starts. So even if you have special permission, you cannot be in the U.S. while your, the school program has already started. Okay. Some of the common questions that we come across. If I fail an exam, am I still eligible for the visa? You are still eligible to apply for the visa. Each applicant is reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. One of the key requirements for the program is demonstrating that you are a serious student with no intention of not returning to your studies. All right? Another question that comes to mind, can I travel outside the US after the closing date for my country? No. During that time, you can only travel within the US as your visa would have expired. You may, however, travel outside the US, the US before that time. But in that case, you would have to make sure you have the proper documents for the country you wish to visit. All right? 
So we will field some more questions at the end of the presentation, but I'm going to hand over now to Jerika, who will talk to you some more about your safety. Thank you so much, Deline. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Jerrica, and I work at the U.S. Embassy as well. And today we're going to talk about how to help you know your rights, know the rules, and get the facts for your J-1 visa. Does anybody know what this document is? I'll bring it kind of close so you can see it. I don't know. Does anybody know what this is? If I say the word Wilberforce, does anybody know what that is? You can just raise your hand. Does anybody know? Okay, I got a little, okay. <laughs> okay, so the Wilberforce Act, which is this document that you'll receive at the end of your J-1 um, interview, it says that you have the right to be paid fairly, to be free from discrimination, free from sexual harassment and sexual exploitation, have a healthy and safe workplace. And when you receive this document at the end of your interview, I encourage you to read it. Why? Because if you are mistreated while you're in the United States, there is a helpful phone number in, on the front of the, of the document. As well as what you have in your hand, there is actually the phone number on there as well. And so if you are mistreated, you can contact the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, the phone number is there for within the United States, and you can also text that phone number. We want to also talk about knowing your rights. So here is an example of someone that went on the student worker program, and they thought that they were going to get a one bedroom, a lovely one bedroom, and this is what they arrived to. You can see there's mattresses on the floor, right? And there's, I guess, about three people that are going to be living in this one room. We do not want that to happen to you. So how can we prevent that? We encourage you to know before you go. First, ask a few questions. Where will your job be? What's your hourly salary? Some things you can ask, for example, the name of your employer and look them up online. Does the website look sketchy? It might be, right? Your housing, you want to ask, does your employer provide housing? And what's the cost and the details of the housing? Try to get as much information um, as you can so that that picture that you saw does not happen to you. Please remember also, no one can cancel or reject your visa except for the Department of Homeland Security or the Department of State. Again, no one can do that except for the Department of Homeland Security or the Department of State. Why is this important? Because we have heard stories of employers taking people's passports, keeping their passports safe. And so you do not have to do that. You need to keep that document with you, OK? The next thing we're going to talk about, knowing the rules. How long can you stay in the United States? How long can you stay in the US? Four months, right? You see here on this, um, the, the screen here, May 5th to September 7th is this year's season. So you have between those two dates to get all of your summer work program travel done within that time. The program start and end date is also on the document that you'll receive when you um, complete your interview. The next thing about knowing your rights is to observe the law. While you're in the United States, you need to make sure you're following the US law. Why? Because if you break the law, of course, you can become deported or something like that. And we don't see any of that happening to you guys, OK? <laughs> Remember also, the drinking age is, um, in the United States is 21. And we do not want people to drink or drive. And of course, please do not open a bank account for someone else. All of these things are things that have actually um, happened. Finally, we want to talk about getting the facts. So here in Jamaica, we have a lot of statistics. One of the things that we have seen when people are coming in for their J-1 visa is that they are doctoring up their GPA scores. So instead of saying, you know, I have a one point this, they'll say I have a three point something. We don't want to see any of that, right? People are falsifying signatures of authorized personnel. 
and they're forging seals, stamps, or logos of institutions. Just bring us the real stuff, right? We'll be able to determine clearly from there. The next thing that we have seen is that people have partnered up with uh, recruiters that are actually not licensed. And this is unfortunate. These are actually some of the stories um, that you'll see in the newspaper where people have given their money to recruiters and the recruiters are not real. So make sure when you are partnering up with a recruiter that that recruiter is legit, right? And finally, on the DS-160, when you guys are filling that out, a lot of times people are filling out the information, for example, the telephone number, email address, emergency contact for the recruiter. But we want to have the information for you. What is your telephone number? What is your email address, right? Um, people also write down the sponsor as um, a person that doesn't even know who they are. So when we call the sponsor and we say so-and-so, they're like, who is that? Just write down the right person that can actually vouch that you are um, applying for this program, okay? So in summary, know your rights, know the rules, and get the facts. Presenting fraudulent documents will affect future visa applications, as well as the possibility of getting arrested, so we don't want that to happen. The summer work travel participants who fail to return in time for the start of their university classes will call into question their eligibility for the future J-1 visas, okay? And of course, don't break the law because it can affect your future visa adjudications. And if your rights are violated, make sure when you get this document, you read it because there's a number on there that you can call and help will be provided. And now we're gonna bring everybody up so we can answer any of the questions that you may have, okay? Do we have a microphone out on the hall, by the way, for folks to ask questions? Is there one in the middle? Okay. <clears throat> we were that good at presenting? Yeah, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, so for <clears throat> final year students, can you expound a bit more on how one could attain a J-1 prior or subsequent to graduation? So um, as we walk through on the presentation, you can participate in the program immediately following your graduation from university. So let's say you're gonna graduate this May, for example. As long as you were a full-time student up to May and you graduated in May, you can still participate the follow-on summer, as long as it's directly connected to the term of your graduation. We're gonna ask you for your graduation date or your graduation document to make that determination, but we get folks who participate all the time. They've finished school, but they're doing the program one more time the summer immediately following their graduation. All right. And the second part is how difficult is it for a final year student to attain a J-1 visa? Well, I don't think it's not any more difficult, and we can all weigh in here, than it is for any other student, as long as they meet the requirements of the program, full-time student status, they've got a valid sponsor, they have a valid DS-2019, they've paid the service fee, the application fee, and they're successful at interview. Again, as, as long as you meet the qualifying requirements for the program, even if you're a last year student, that's fine. And, and to reiterate some of the points uh, that Delene in particular made, the, we're looking for full-time full status for us is 12 credit hours or more per semester to, to be a full-time student. We're really, we really don't need to see a transcript to establish that. If you've got a document from the institution that certifies you are registered as a full-time student and it's a current document from the present semester or term, that's fine. Um, a lot of people get hung up on transcripts. I know it's difficult to get them sometimes um, and that's really not required. It's, it's proof of your full-time standing in the institution and that can come in a, a number of different forms. A related point really quickly on grades, because this came up in the presentation. We get a lot of questions, what's the GPA that's required? What is a serious student? That can mean a lot of different things. We want to make sure you're a student 
who is academically in good standing at the institution and is still registered and valid as a full-time student. If you're on academic probation or you've been actually dismissed and this is your last semester before you're not allowed to come back, then you wouldn't qualify. But if you're academically in good standing, there is no specific GPA requirement to qualify for the program itself. Does that yeah. answer, answer your question? It does, thank Did you. Did you guys have anything you want to add? Delina? Well, as Jeff said, sometimes students get hung up on the transcripts. And you find that during the busy SWT season, they'll ask for a transcript. They don't get it in time, and the feeler can't come in, or they ask the institution to send it to us, and then it's probably not there as yet in the time for their interview. So it's really important that you understand that the transcript really is not required. What is required is proof of your full-time student status, all right? And, and very helpfully to you and to us, when you come for your interview, make sure you've got your DS-2019 in hand, um, that you've got it before you come to the interview. Because if you don't, we're going to have to suspend your case. You'll have to send it in later. It's another delay in your case. And it, it, it causes delays just in processing visas generally. Yeah. Also, the same thing for your student status. As soon as you're accepted into, by a recruiter and you're placed in a program and you're on your way to getting your DS-2019, go ahead and solicit that proof of your status from your institution. So you've got that ready to go whenever your interview is scheduled. And I'll, I'll get in a little while to how we're doing interviews this year and how many we're scheduling and what availability is, because that's an important piece of all of this, is actually getting the interview slot. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, it's hard to hear. Oh, yeah, Good afternoon. You hear me Good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. So I have... Good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> I have a few questions here. Um, the first one is, would students who started in the semester, this semester, January, qualify for the program? OK, thank you. Um, the second is, is it open to master's students? Because there are some non-GPE master's scores. So, so really, there is no, as the presentation said, there's no specific age limit on the program. So as long as you're a full-time student, you know, master's level, undergraduate level, as long as you're full-time, you can qualify for the program. Okay, but those scores wouldn't have a GPA, just saying. Some of the master's courses aren't GPA. They don't have any type of GPA with them. Okay, no problem. So yeah, um, we have, there is no specific GPA requirement. As long as you're a master's student who's in, enrolled as a full-time student in graduate study, that still qualifies. Okay, noted, thanks. And how do you check the legitimacy of recruiters? I know there is a, a list, you had mentioned a list for the sponsors, but is there a list for the recruiters or the agencies in Jamaica? So this is, this is actually, it's an important question. And you know, I, one, I know that the, the Ministry of Labor has been looking into because um, my understanding is there's not a system formalized for the certification of recruiters here in Jamaica for this program because the ministry is focused on foreign labor recruiters for full-time employment in the United States, H workers, things like that. Um, I can only say that I would definitely make sure you're working with an official sponsor and there is a list online you can check that the sponsor is officially certified. Um, you know, your recruiter relationship is a difficult thing for us because we don't certify recruiters. We don't want people victimized, but we can't tell you whether this recruiter is good or bad or, or you know, helpful or not helpful. And every year we're often asked questions because a conflict has developed between a recruiter and a student or between a recruiter and an employer or sponsor. And those are really um, different relationships. We're about the visa process. I can only say, ask a lot of questions, make sure the sponsor is fully certified. Take, you can, you have every right to write the sponsor in the United States and say, are you working with this specific recruiter in Jamaica? And they should be able to tell you. Um, and if they're not, that raises some, some issues and concerns. Um, same thing on fees, you know, it, it, ask a lot of questions, make sure you understand what is expected and how the recruiter is dealing with the fee side of application and everything else because we don't want to see you financially victimized as as Jerica mentioned by someone who is a malified recruiter or not a recruiter at all. Okay, thank you. you I think you kind of answered this question too by that one but just to 
make everything clear. Is there a summer camp aspect to the J1 program? Because I thought it was just like tourism and so stuff, it, service jobs. It gets a little confusing because there are multiple streams of J visas. J is the umbrella for all different types of exchange visas to the United States. And some of these are summer programs related to employment or exchange in the US. Summer work and travel is one of them. And that's what we're talking about here today. There's a separate program for camp counselors to go to the US, and there are people that recruit here for that program as well. It has slightly different requirements. The length of time, everything else is slightly different. Your qualities as a student to qualify as a camp counselor are also different than they are to qualify for the, the J Summer Work and Travel program. So my best advice on that program this Bridge USA site I mentioned, if you just Google Bridge USA, it is a site run by the Department of State, who we work for, that outlines all these different summer programs in the United States, including Camp Counselor, including summer work and travel. Bridge USA. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and just for everybody's awareness, we just put the slide back up for questions. It's really important that you take agency in this process and you ask questions um, so that you're prepared and you feel as though that you're working with a valid uh, recruiter. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, just a little clarity I was hoping for. You said that there's a list online for sponsors from the Ministry of Labor. So actually, the list I was mentioning was, for, it's on this Bridge USA site. It's a list oh, okay. of official sponsors in the United States. So it's, it's the sponsors in the US that are recruiting outside the United States for the summer work and travel program is on the, the Bridge for, USA site. Oh, thank you. Is there also a list for um, agencies? So I, I know this is something, and I can't speak for the Ministry of Labor here, I know they've been looking into how, how can they um, regulate or better kind of manage recruitment activity of this type in Jamaica but I would have to refer you to the, to the ministry and, and their site. I'm not, I'm not aware of a certified list of summer work and travel recruiters that they have here in Jamaica right now. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, good afternoon. good afternoon. So you said earlier that we need to do 12 credits or more to show that we're full-time students. What if you did 12 credits last semester but you didn't pass some modules so you didn't earn all those 12 credits? Do you still have a good chance? At the interview? So what really counts is your status right now. So you know, let's say last semester a couple of courses didn't go so well and you didn't get the credits for those. You were still registered full time, you just might not have been successful in those, those particular courses. If you get into the spring term and you're registered full time and you're in full time status, 12 or more credit hours in that semester, then you, you would qualify as a student in full-time status. As long as you're in good standing with the university and registered full-time, that counts. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Jamani Dunn. I'm the assistant registrar for the admissions and international office here at Mona. So I just wanted to really thank you for your excellent... Oh, that's it. Hi, good, Hello. better. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Jamani Dunn. I'm the assistant registrar here at the Admissions and International Office here at Mona. And so I just wanted to thank you again for your excellent presentation and for the information that you shared. I think for the students, it's really um, something that they would need. And this opportunity is really um, important and powerful. Um, my question is really looking at the fraudulent documents that you had mentioned. So I wanted to get a sense as to just how prevalent that was and if there's anything that we can do as an institution to you know, prevent that and to support the efforts there. You mean, you mean regarding like documentation of student status, for example? Right. Indeed. Okay. Well, it's, I, first of all, we, we appreciate the work you do because I know it, it, at certain points of the calendar, there are a lot of these types of requests and it's a lot of work for your office to generate them. So um, we, we know we help generate some of that demand and we appreciate you, you doing that work. Um, just knowing the application cycle, knowing when these might come in and kind of being prepared to produce the documentation that students might require, um, and having good ways for us to work with you, certified signatures, things that help us make sure it's a valid document, it's important because we want to protect the integrity of the documentation you produce Certainly. by making sure every, everyone that's presented is, is genuine. Um, so that, that's helpful and we can, we can talk out, you know, after and offline about different ways we can work together sure. on that. Uh, and on that point, 
Jerica mentioned, every year we do receive a number from not, we have applications from all over Jamaica, every different type of institution. We sometimes do get false documentation, false transcripts, right. uh, false signatures, things like that. And I want to underscore the potential, at least in terms of your visa, lifelong consequences of doing that type of thing. It is 100% not worth it to take that route because in our law, if you present a false document that's material to the visa adjudication, you could be barred from getting a U.S. visa for, for life. And we don't want that to happen to people. So we really want to underscore that message here today. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm back. <laughs> Good afternoon again. So let's phrase this this way. Masters, being accepted into a master's program overseas, US preferably, yes? Um, graduation is in November. Um, what is the, do I, would I experience any difficulties with the program, being that I would just continue being in the US subsequent to the program ending? So you, you would have been in the U.S. on a student visa in the U.S. until, until November, right? Let's say I'm on it on the J-1. Okay. Then the student visa comes through afterwards. Would I experience any problems is a question. Well, you, you would still need a student visa to be able to study in the United States. So, you know, you're, let's say you're on the J program over the course of the summer. Um, that's fine. And there are, there are many students that are studying in the United States on Fs, the, that's our student visa class, who also hold simultaneously every year a J because they'll, they'll be studying on their F and then coming and doing the exchange program in the summer on their J, even though they're, you know, both visas are put, placing them in the United States. That, that's fine. If you're talking about transitioning from J to F, um, that's a little different kind of process. Sometimes that can be done as adjustment of status. Sometimes you have to exit to re-enter where you acquire the student visa and then go back or vice versa um, if you don't hold them concurrently. So uh, one good email address I don't think uh, we mentioned specifically, I wanna go back to and make sure it's on the screen. Oops. Uh, yeah, it's at the beginning. I'll, I'll, Here we go. So at the bottom of the screen there, under summer work and travel, it's kingstonniv at state.gov. That's the main email inquiries box for the non-immigrant visa unit at the U.S. Embassy. And you know, if you've got a particular scenario or question that's a little more complicated like that, sometimes it's easier we can respond directly and, and push you specific information, links, things that help you in your particular situation. But yeah, it's, you can hold both at once. You can go from one to the other. That's all possible as long as you qualify independently for each visa class. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, good afternoon. Just ask a bit of clarification on something. Uh, I've been hearing um, sponsors and recruiters being used interchangeably, kind of. So I was wondering if you could clarify the differences or if how it works and how that helps you get a job with the program. Because I'm a little confused on how that works. So. I didn't quite hear the question. Okay, so you're basically asking the difference between the recruiter and the sponsor and how it works? That's what you're saying? Yes. Okay, so basically you can go directly through a sponsor. Some persons go through recruiters or agencies which are here and interact with the sponsors in the US. Do you understand? Yes, thank you. Right. Um, um, my last question is, um, how late is the app application process like? How late down in the year could I apply and still possibly get through for a visa and the other parts? How late down in the year, sorry? How late, how close to the date of the work and travel could I apply and still get through? Like reasonably speaking, like in March, April. So um, conceivably, <clears throat> you know, as long as you can get an appointment and you've got the valid, you qualify, you've got the DS-2019, you've paid all the fees and you can get the interview appointment, you you can qualify into the program and get the J summer work and travel visa right up in, into the summer even, you know, into May and June. The problem is this, that we um, allocate as much capacity to this program as we possibly can for interview at the embassy. And this year, we're allocating more than we have in probably the last five years 
for interview spaces, to make as many available up front to everyone as we possibly can, right? Um, about 10,000 actually right now are on the system. So that's good news. But those fill quickly. As people get their DS-2019s, they get placed into jobs and they, they start looking for interviews, you'll find those interview slots will get fewer and fewer. My best advice is, as soon as you get your DS-2019, pay your fees, go on the system, get an appointment, and get it as early as possible as you can in the season. Uh, because you want to give yourself some buffer in case there are more documents required or something like that before the actual start date of your travel. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, good day. Uh, the, be the beginning date is the 5th of May, right? And the end date is the 7th of September. So do we have to leave the U.S. by the 7th of September? Yes. Okay. So, so no matter what happens, what, a lot of people, they might finish their work at the job site, let's say the 1st of August. The program allows you to take up to 30 days to travel in the U.S. Part of it is to go experience the United States, not just as somebody working there, but as somebody who can travel, visit other places, do other things. You can do that up to 30 days, so long as that's over by the 7th of September, 2023. If you return after that date, it's gonna cause you issues in future years of applying for the program and maybe for other types of visas, because you've technically overstayed the program. Okay, right thank you. You're welcome. One other quick point on work um, that I, might have been mentioned in the presentation. Remember, you're placed at a particular job site in a particular job. You can't go out and seek a second job or an additional job in the evening or on top of the J job that you've taken. You can only work in the capacity that you're allowed to under the J program, not any other capacity or job. Another question around the processes. So you would have to pay your, your sponsorship fee and your service fee first and then make the visa application. Say for whatever reason you're um, unsuccessful in your visa interview, would the sponsorship fee be refunded? So, so there isn't a sponsorship fee per se. There's the, um, the application fee for the, the actual visa. That's the, what we call the MRV fee, the machine readable visa fee. That's $160. Mm -hmm. There's the SEVIS fee, which is a fee that relates to the system that tracks students and people on exchange programs in the United States. And for our end of the visa process, that's it. Oh. Um, there aren't any other fees that we assess or require of applicants. That's interesting because there's... Oh, if, if you're not successful. Fee. So we, we don't refund any visa application fees uh, or, or SEVIS fees if you're unsuccessful. Yeah, um, noted. Um, but there are... So most of the agents would list sponsorship fees. Yes. So again, this is something we can't really speak to the, your relationship with the agent other than to be very careful and ask a lot of questions about the fees they're charging. And... If you're not successful, again, that's if they're not refunding a fee that they said they would or there was some other understanding about the fees they assessed or charged for placement, that's something that has to be dealt with between the student and the recruiter. We're not involved in that particular relationship. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, could you provide any clarity after working as a J1 student, like how you go about doing taxes, tax return? So it's, it's a good question. Most J students are going to fall below the minimal threshold to file an income tax return in the United States. Generally, that's around $10,000 US before you have to file a, a, an actual application. You might well be subject to what are called payroll taxes in the United States, which fund things like um, uh, a range of different types of social services that protect workers, for example. That might be part of what comes out of your check. But as far as filing, there's a threshold limit beyond which if you earn more than that, you must file. Um, generally, you're not gonna pay taxes if you're earning that kind of student, summer student type money. Um, unless they're paying you much more than the rest of the students are, are earning, yeah. But generally, that's, it's, it's not so much. It's a good question, and it is something that, you know, both sponsors and recruiters and your employer in the United States can help you navigate, because they're the ones who are actually generating the checks that, that pay you in the U.S. Thank you. You're welcome. All 
Hi, good afternoon again, everyone. I'm asking on behalf of the persons online. Okay. So first, there is a bit of confusion with the concept of GPA and registered full-time students. Um, one, I don't think the students are grasping required credits um, to be qualified for the course. So I have one student asking that if she does four courses, but one of the courses don't have a credit attached, where does she go from there? Um, and then students are also asking if they're registered as full-time students, but their GPA is not good, where do they go from there? So I think they want to know, one, is a requirement that you just need to be a full-time student? Has that requirement changed to regards to having a specific GPA? Or is it that GPAs are no longer being included in the concept for your interview? So, so these are all great questions and we're glad they're being asked because this is something that hangs up a lot of applications every year and we're trying to streamline things and make them a little more straightforward for people that are applying. So a GPA is a measure of your academic performance. We are not really specifically concerned with what your, your GPA is. We want to make sure you're a registered full-time student no matter what that GPA is. Right. Um, and by full-time in the United States we tend to mean 12 to 15 credit hours or more uh, per semester. So that means number of contact hours in class. Right. Um, but really, what we're asking most of all is, from your institution, official documentation certified that says you're registered as a full-time student at that institution at the time of your application. Right. right. OK. Thank you for that. And I also have a next question. Um, a student is wondering if there's a case in which your DS2019 form is given to you close to the program starting date. Is that a problem? So this goes back to the, the appointments and getting interviews. And one important piece this year I want everybody to understand is we are trying to make as much availability for interview appointments up front as we possibly can. We're going to put everything we can onto the system. And everything that we're going to put on the system will be on there early. So everybody has an equal chance to get those appointments. If you're looking at the end of the season, you might find all the spots have been taken. And we are not um, actually doing expedites of these cases. We don't consider them to be emergencies because we've put a lot of availability up early to our full capacity early in the season. So that's why I'm saying start early, get your DS-2019 early, get all your documents in line, and schedule an interview as, as soon as you possibly can to give yourself the best shot at getting in front of an officer to, to get the visa to go on the program. Okay, good. And this is my final question. I'm, I'm not sure. For now, of course, I'm going to have to go and check back. But um, as I was asking, what are the possibilities of doing two um, US visa interviews for the J-1 program if you have failed at your first chance going? Uh, it's, it's another good question, and it's, it's an important one for us to answer. So our system really is, as you make your appointment on the system, it will ask you if you've had a visa refusal within the last six months. Mm -hmm. And if you say yes, it's not going to let you schedule a visa appointment. We expect people to be uh, forthright and honest in how they answer that question on the appointment system. Uh, this summer, if you come before an officer and you've just been refused the visa a, f a few weeks earlier, we're going to suspend your case until that six months is up. And that functionally means you won't be able to participate in the program. So trying multiple times, the only way you can do that is if you misrepresent your refusal history on the appointment system, and we encourage people not to do that. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. You're welcome. Hi, good afternoon. So I heard you mentioned the cost of the application for the visa, and you also mentioned the civis fee, if that's how it's pronounced. Can you expound on it and how much it would cost, please? For the... the the application fee is 160, and the SEVIS fee, I want to, yeah, we think it's 35. It, de it actually depends on the kind of program you're going, but um, for summer work and travel, this program, it's only $35, yeah. Okay, $35? Okay, thank you. Um, so, following up on the question that the person just asked is that in general for um, any visa like if you just applied and you got denied you can go back for the J-1 visa? That, that it will ask you if you've had any visa refusal in the last six months, any visa refusal in the last six months. Yeah. It, okay. Thanks. Alright, one more question. Um, so someone is wondering what 
if it is that you are being filed for by a parent or a spouse, are you allowed to go on the J1 program nonetheless? So um, if it's a common situation here. There are a lot of Jamaicans that have connections to the United States, f family members that petition for them to immigrate to the U.S. And uh, the, the only answer I can really give to that question is it really depends on the nature of the petition that's been made for you. How current is it? Is it a, a current application to immigrate to the U.S.? Or is it just an initial filing? That sort of thing. But remember, the, the center of our immigration law uh, is determining whether or not the person has immigrant intent. And that doesn't mean you can't have an immigrant visa application in place uh, in order to qualify for this program, but it might be something the officer considers or has to consider in adjudicating the case of the applicant for the Jason Moore Work and Travel program. I know it's not a clean answer, but that's the, the best one I can, I can give you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? One more? Okay. So my students are a little shy. Um, so I'm asking three questions. The okay. first question is, um, someone wants to just have some sort of expounding on the concept of the probation. Um, secondly, someone wants to know what happens um, with the 30 days period after your time has up. What happens if one you happen to be over there after the 30 days period? Or what happens if you don't take advantage of the 30 days period? Um, and then, maybe academic, <clears throat> academic probation, maybe. Oh, yes, yes. And so one student was saying that her degree puts her in a place where for her final semester, which would be the semester she registered while going on the J-1 program, she would not meet the 12 to 15 credits because that degree only as a full-time student facilitates 7.5 credits. She wants to know what would happen in a case like that, seeing that it's not a case that she's not a registered student, but that is the stipulated credits to do. Right. So on the first one, on the probation question, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether the question means academic probation at the institution where they're studying or some other kind of probation. So if we could get some clarification on that. Um, what I was talking about in, in terms of a student in good standing, that means somebody who's not on the cusp of being ejected from the university because of academic issues. That's, you know, for you to be a student who's going to return, you have to have the ability to return to your studies. And if the university is telling you you have to leave after this semester, you're not really in that status. Um, the sec what was the second question again? Could you remind me, ma'am? The 30, okay, for the 30 days. So you don't have to use the 30 days, but you have to use the 30 days after the conclusion of your work or before it initiates. Um, and that 30 days has to be within that four month window allowed for the Jamaican program. If you stay longer than the 30 days provided for, you're technically not in compliance with the terms of the visa. So don't, don't do that. And certainly don't stay after the, the end date for the program of September 7th, because it, it makes it harder for you to make the case you're a returning student if you're not actually returning by the time studies begin again in the fall semester. That's why that requirement is there. Uh, and there was one other question, ma'am? Oh, right. So the, um, unfortunately, if you're not a full-time student, we, you can't qualify for the program. So if you're in a semester where your credit hours make you a part-time student, you're not going to be able to qualify for the terms uh, of the J Summer Work and Travel program. That's unfortunate, but that, that is the way the program is structured. You have to be a full-time student. 
Right, that's what she was saying, that even if she's a full-time student, but her, her degree is a special one in which on your final semester, you only get 7.5 credits. Um, what happens then? So there are some situations, and maybe the university can be helpful in documenting different types of programs, where your classroom component might only be you know, 6 or 7.5 credits, but you're doing some kind of a practicum or independent study or writing a, a thesis or something like that that, is, that constitutes the equivalent of full-time studies. Have them document that and bring that in. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we talked about probation, though. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. I would love if you could just do for one more time, just um, explain to the sense what would be cases in which they would not be approved for their J-1 visa, because I think they're still trying to make sure they dot their I's and cross their T's for that one. So I, I think we can all speak to this in different different ways, um, but you know, remember the the program requirements. We're going to have we have a leave behind sheet. We forgot to mention that's got a lot of these tips and guides on it, and there's a, a front sheet that kind of explains the basic requirements of the program. Uh, but remember, full time student working with a certified sponsor, a valid DS 2019. You've paid your visa application fee, you've paid your SEVIS fee, and you've qualified at interview. Those, those are the things. You don't have to have a 4.0 grade point average. You, you, know, you could have as few as 12 credits. There are a whole range of different things that can come to bear uh, on your qualification. We're most interested in, do you meet the technical requirements for the program, and are you otherwise qualified? Um, and for us, uh, it's a fairly straightforward process, yeah. And I think the other side, um, on my side of the house, it's important that you're bringing um, documents that are correct, so no doctor documents, um, because that will, of course, lead to you having your visa refused. And just to add to that, make sure that you have your original DS 2019 when you come in, and that the service fee has been paid, all right? Hi, my name is Tina Shea. Uh, I've been on J1 last year, mm -hmm. so I'm using the opportunity to find something out because I won't be on it this year. But I have a regular visa where I go visit my family sometime. That is stolen. So how can I replace my visa? I know, I know what I'm supposed to do to get back my passport, but how do I go about replacing that visa when I want to go visit family? So un unfortunately, there aren't any provisions to reprint an existing visa. So when a visa is lost or stolen or destroyed or damaged beyond use, it's, it no longer um, is valid uh, in our system. To replace it, you have to make another application, fill out the application, pay the fee, schedule an interview, and then um, uh, acquire the visa. We do have a program for interview waiver, but to qualify for interview waiver as a renewal, you have to be able to present the old visa for cancellation. And if it's been lost or stolen, you're not able to do that. So you have to schedule an interview to reacquire the visa. Thank you. Thank you. Also, to add to that, in that case, you would need a report from the police station, the nearest police station, that documents you know, how it was lost, a report from them to say that you had reported it yes. and how it is that this you know happened which you would also bring with you to the interview to prove huh? and report it to us. yes and report and that they, that would be reported to us so you need to bring that with you the original document in addition to the other documents required for the appointment okay thank you yeah anytime you lose a visa like let's say your passport's lost or stolen do let us know I, that, something like that address there, make the report to us as well, because we want to make sure your visa is not used by somebody else uh, to enter the United States. That will cause you a lot of trouble down the line. Any, any other questions? Well, I want to thank everybody for coming, including uh, my colleagues from the, the visa unit today. Um, we're lucky we get to live here. We get to meet Jamaicans all the time. But please go to the United States and, and give our fellow citizens of the U.S. the chance to meet you every summer. It's a great program. We really love it. And uh, we hope to see you at the visa window soon. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.
All right, everyone, just before you go, I do know that, you know, we've been way more informed compared to what we were an hour and a half or two hours ago. To the members of the U.S. Embassy, let me see if I can tilt this mic. Thank you. All right, to the members of the U.S. Embassy, on behalf of the University of the West Indies, our students, our staff, our guild, and all other assistants and personnel here, we want to say thank you. A big, big thank you for taking the time out to come here to inform us, to prepare us to answer the questions that we've had for days, weeks, but had no one to ask, and to honestly just to pro provide a path, per se, going into our visa um, interviews and just going up for that program. I do hope that you made the university a friend because we have made you a friend wholeheartedly. If there's anything that you should need from us, don't hesitate to reach out. We look forward to building a stronger relationship, and overall, we appreciate everything that you've done for us this afternoon. So on behalf of the University of the West Indies and students, love it and we look forward to more successful meetings like this students don't forget you can always ask your questions visit the website visit the website look out for the sponsors look out for more information and i wish you all the best on this program yes And those who have been asking questions about knowing your rights, we do have some booklets here. So if it is that you do want some more information, please see me after this. I do have information here for you. Thank you all so much and have yourselves a good afternoon. <laughs>